Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. Let, amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. We ask for a sweet anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know every need, Lord, before we even ask. So I'm praying now as I minister this word, you would begin to inspire hearts. You would begin to meet needs. You would begin to just pour out your love upon your people. Let this word make a difference in our lives today. And we'll give you all the praise. And the church agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. There is nothing that makes better preaching material than stories about our Lord Jesus Christ. This story is 2,000 years old, but it's just as real today as it was back then. It's a story of love, compassion, and mercy. We know that Jesus always excelled in showing mercy, and wherever he went, he showed compassion to everyone. He came, if you will, to this earth on a mission, but it was a mission that was motivated by the love that he had for this world and for us. I cannot think of a time when Jesus turned anyone who came to him away, not one. We go to people sometimes, and sometimes they help us, and at other times they don't. You see, they are human and subject to weakness and to limitations. They are just like us. Sometimes they have, if you will, their own struggles and their own problems. They're unable to help us because they're loaded down with their problems. But Jesus was never at a loss. Jesus was never too loaded down with his own problems that he couldn't help someone who came to him. I've read the book from cover to cover. And not one time do I find a time that Jesus turned anyone away. All A-L-L -L that came to Jesus found the help that they needed. He always has time for someone in need. Just like he has time for you here this morning. You may have come in and you're a little antsy. Maybe you're in a rush. But I want to tell you, God is not in a rush this morning. God knows what you needed before you walked through the back doors of this church. And God has a plan. Amen. He said as we sang the song, he'll get involved and he'll bring good out of it, whatever it is. God is a faithful God and he knows what you have need of today. He's not burdened down. He's not too busy. Your need is not too great that he cannot meet it. There's never been anybody like the Son of God. There's never been anybody like Jesus, and there never will be. He came to seek and to save the lost and to repair the broken and comfort the hurting. The Bible says that Jesus had gone to the Mount of Olives. Most likely he went there to pray and spend time with his Father. And I just want to say, I think Jesus was always ready to minister because he went and prayed first. And I think it's a great idea that we pray first and then minister. Praying first is a good idea. Pray first and then buy the car. Pray first and then change jobs. Pray first, then tackle the project. Pray first, if you will, then sell the house. It says, then Jesus, after going to the Mount of Olives, went early into the temple and he began to preach and to minister to the people. And they gathered there to hear him because nobody ever taught like Jesus taught. For he taught as one who had power and had authority. He always took time for people. He was never too busy to help you, never too burdened down. He never went on vacation and put up a not available sign. It says in Psalms 46 and 1 that he is our refuge and that he is an ever... Did, did you know God is your refuge this morning? And that he is an ever-present help in time of need today. And I don't know what Jesus was teaching them that morning, but I believe he might have been talking about the wondrous and miraculous love of God and how the love of God will lift a person up out of the gutters of life, up out of their addictions, up out of their problems and pain, up out of their difficulties, and nothing, if you will, amen, can lift you up and heal you like the love of God can. I could not face life without Jesus, my helper. 
and my Savior. I don't know what I would do if it were not for the Lord. My burdens are way too great to carry. My problems are too complex to solve. I'm not strong enough, smart enough to fix those things that are wrong in my life. And that's why my song has always been and always will be, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Come on, church, we serve a great and a mighty God. There is nobody like our Jesus. He's my greatest joy of my life. Not only because he lives, but because I know he cares about me. He cares about me, if you will, with an unconditional love. You see, sometimes we care, but we're a little conditional in how we care. We care for people if they care for us. We love people if they love us. We help people with their problems if they help us with our problems. Or we help them if we're not overwhelmed with our own. But Jesus cares unconditionally, and he cares at all times. I came today to tell you he doesn't have a computerized prayer answering service. Hello? This is Jesus, sorry, the, uh, I'm not available today. Press one if you have a prayer request. Press two if you have a crisis on your hand. Press three for all other inquiries. No, he's never too busy, amen. And it doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter what failures you've had in your life. It doesn't matter how hard you've fallen. Jesus cares about you. Jesus loves you. And Jesus can help you this morning. He can change you and transform you and he can make a new person out of you for the scripture says if any man be in Christ behold old things are passed away and all things are become new you may not be able to change it you may not be able to fix it but if we'll get Jesus in our lives and we will trust in him and call on the name of the Lord we shall be saved amen how many times have I been discouraged with no strength, feeling weak, overwhelmed with it all. But somehow I was able to stumble into the secret place of the Most High and begin to talk to my Savior Jesus. And every time I've been hurting and broken and in pain, I come to Him and I say, Jesus, I just need a little help right now. And I sing that song, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. And He always, always has helped me. He's never failed me. And I'm going on 40 years. 40 years. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. No appointments are necessary. No credit card needed to leave a deposit. Just come unto me, all of you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's glad to see us when we come before him. He always listens. He always cares. He always helps every single time. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. When you go through the waters, they will not overtake you. And when you go through the fire, it will not burn you. Amen. And now I'm getting carried away. I need to go back to the story here. Hey. So in comes the bloodthirsty scribes and Pharisees. And they have this woman... And they put her right there in the midst. They start pointing their self-righteous fingers at her and begin to accuse her and said, this lady here was caught in the very act and we're ready to stone her. Can you imagine how she must have felt? This woman was ready to die. They were going to literally take her life, stone her because she was caught in the very act. They were after her blood. And so he says, Moses says in the law, Jesus, that she was found guilty. And it's obvious she's guilty. There's no question about her guilt. She was caught in the very act. And Moses says she shall be stoned. But here's their mistake. But what do you say? This was an attempt, if you will, to discredit Jesus. They were going to try to trap him to go against the law of Moses. But how many of you understand Jesus is just too wise for that? He's not going to fall into that trap. Can you picture her standing there, this woman? Her lips quivering, perhaps smeared red, some kind of red scarlet color smeared on her lips. Her cheeks flushed with shame and such a frightened look on her face. 
Her sin is brought out to light right in front of the whole world to see. And the religious folks have their stones and she's about to die. And they wanted Jesus to condemn her to death. But Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. <laughs> Amen. Here we have the law of Moses demanding death. But here we have the law of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They wanted to give her death but Jesus wanted to give her everlasting life. Could you imagine that? She was committing adultery one moment and just a few hours later perhaps she was transformed into a saint. Amen. Changed by the love and the power and the mercy of Jesus Christ. I'm glad to tell you that the law of God's love won out over the law of Moses this day. And it's at this point that Jesus stoops down and he begins to write what I call love letters in the sand. And he just begins to write now, nobody really knows what he wrote. Everyone has their opinion. I personally think that maybe he wrote something about some of the stuff going on in these self-righteous people's lives. Maybe he just scooped down and wrote casino. <laughs> maybe one of those Pharisees had been out drinking, partying all night, and gambling all of his money away. He just writes casino. <laughs> Reminds me of a story I read this week. There was... An uh, older woman at a bus stop, and she's there, and these people are gathering around, and she sees this fellow who makes her a little uncomfortable. He's kind of rough looking, and she's concerned about her safety, really. And then she sees people come up and start handing him dollar bills and, and, and whispering words of encouragement in his ear. She says, why not? Why don't I give this a try to? Lord, help me with this. She pulls out a very generous gift of $10, walks over, hands him the $10 and says, don't despair, don't despair. She comes back the next day to the bus stop and that same fellow's there and this fellow walks right up to her, gives her a $100 bill. Says, what are you doing? What do you mean, lady, what am I doing? You said don't despair, I heard it clear clearly. Don't despair one yesterday. The odds, amen, were 10 to 1. Here's your winnings. <laughs> now, maybe she didn't understand what was going on, but I want to tell you, Jesus understood what was going on here. And Jesus was a man on a mission. He's always fishing. He's always looking to help somebody, to lift them up and to transform them and to give them abundant life. And so when I look at this story, what I see is I see the love, the mercy, and the compassion of God. And so now Jesus gets up and he looks up and says, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And I say, Yes, he got him. Yes, this is so cool. Jesus, you're great, man. You, you laid it on. So people tried to trap him so many times, but he was so filled with the spirit of wisdom. It says he had the spirit of God without measure. He had not only wisdom, he had the wisdom of God and the leading of the Lord in his life. Nobody could trap Jesus. And so he says, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. What Jesus is saying is this. None of you are perfect. None of you are without sin. None of you are qualified to throw a stone at this woman. And the results were amazing. It says they were convicted in their own conscience. And it says they walked out beginning with the oldest to the youngest. And they walked away. He who was without sin cast the first stone. And if I'm talking to any stone throwers here this morning, I've got three words, two words for you, three times. Stop it, stop it, stop it. We can't cast stones that, at people who are not like us. We can't cast stones because they're a Democrat and I'm a Republican. We cannot cast stones because they don't do things the way that we do things. My message today is don't cast stones at other people.
people in glass houses shouldn't cast stones. When people throw stones at you, don't throw them back. Keep them and build something valuable with them. This really says a whole lot. Who are we to cast stones at others? Lord, have mercy on, on stone casters. Amen. Nobody. We are so imperfect. We are so messed up ourselves. You want me to give you proof? Don't take my word. Here's Romans 2 and 1. Listen to this. This will sober us all up. You, therefore, at Harbor Light Church. No. <laughs> you rascals over there, amen, at the bagel bar. No. You, therefore, at Teen Challenge. No. <laughs> all of us, okay? From the pulpit back to the cheap seats. All of us. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. That's what God says right here. Now, no, I don't, Pastor. You don't know that for sure. Well, I'm going to believe the word of God over you, okay? This is what it says. You might not do the same thing exactly, but in principle you do the same thing. It might be packaged in a different box, a different circumstance, but you and I, we all do the same things that we see people doing that are irritating us and getting us all worked up. Here's the point. Only Jesus is qualified to cast stones and he will never cast a stone. He just doesn't cast stones. So Jesus looks up and he sees that everyone is gone except the woman. And she could have left too. But I kind of think she stood around just because she loved Jesus. She, she just had her life saved. She was in the presence of the Savior. And he was, she was so excited. Could you imagine if she showed up at one of our small groups this week and someone says, hey, sh share your testimony. How'd you come? Oh, no, no, I don't, no, I don't want to share that. Please share your testimony. Well, I was doing this one thing one day and I got caught right in the act of adultery and, and they were going to take me and stone me. What a testimony. How many of you know Jesus can save anyone? What a testimony. I was caught in the middle of my sin, taken out to be stoned, but he, we stopped and talked to a teacher named Jesus, and he saved my life, and he loved me instead of throwing stones at me, and he told those rascals, amen, to take that, and whoever's without sin, you cast the first stone. My Jesus saved my life. What a testimony. I love testimonies. This one here takes the cake. So just, just a couple takeaways. I'm almost done. A couple takeaways that I see. Number one, this is also a story about getting caught red-handed in our sin. She thought she was so clever. She thought she was going to get away with it, but she got red-handed caught. Man, she was, she was nailed. And I, I wrote this down. Sometimes getting caught is the best thing that can happen to a person. When Chanel and Brad were staying with us, I called Chanel food police. <laughs> she was the food police. If you're going to have something sweet, you better have it when she's not in the kitchen. So I had been eating really good for about two weeks. Hey. For me, that's pretty darn good. Someone say amen. amen. Eating really good. So I said to myself, I said, self, you've done so good. You deserve some of that Rocky Road ice cream that's in the freezer. So I go over to the kitchen. I pull that Rocky Road out, and I'm already smiling. Yes! Set it on the counter. Turn around, get the scooper out. Set it on the counter. Go get my bowl, bring it there and set it down. And I take that scooper and I just begin to bear down on that first scoop when the kitchen door flew open. And in comes Chanel and she looks, Dad, what are you doing? Well, what's it look like I'm doing? She was the most annoying food detective I've ever seen. 
She knew how to bust you. I don't know whether she had a sixth sense or whether she was of the Lord or... Well, she probably saved me a few pounds anyways. Amen. And sometimes it's good to get caught. Amen. I was caught red-handed. Probably the best thing ever happened to me. Don't ever remind me of this, Chanel. Don't remind me I said that. And, and, and this woman thought she was real sneaky. But she got caught red-handed. So here's a truth bomb, okay? Fasten your seatbelt. Listen to this. We all need to hear this. We really never get away with our sin. She was doing this in secret, and she thought nobody would know. Listen to Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. And I, I wrote this down that I read this week from an author. He, sa he says, in the statement, be sure your sin will find you out, is revealed the mystery of sin. The nature of sin is such that whether or not others discover your sin, your sin will discover you. You cannot run from the consequences of your sin. Sin carries within itself the power to pay the sinner back. She didn't get away with her sin, and neither will we. But listen to Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin, he that hides it, will not prosper. But he that, amen, confesses his sin will find the mercy of God. Why do you have this mental image of God with a big baseball bat ready to beat you over the head? That's not the God I serve. The God I serve won't hit you with a baseball bat. He won't throw stones at you. If you'll just come to him and be honest, he'll cast your sin as far as the east is to the west, never ever to remember it again. He is a good God. And then the work, second little takeaway is this. Jesus said this, neither do I condemn thee. I love this. Neither do I condemn thee. Jesus, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Can I tell you, Jesus is never ever going to condemn you. He came to forgive you. Now, this word condemn has two, two parts of meaning to it. First is to, to find guilty, if you will, and then also to sentence. In other words, the prisoner was found guilty of murder and he was condemned to death. And so it has the connotation of both being found guilty and also, if you will, being sentenced. And what God says in Romans 8.1, it says this, There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. And can I tell you something today? The church needs to get this. We really need to understand this if we're going to be free in Jesus Christ. Because we, we blow it. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. And every time we make a mistake, the devil's there to lie to us and to get on our back. And, and, and he can't stop you, but he'll do everything he can to discourage you, to lie to you, to hinder you. But here's the truth. Jesus says that if you are in Christ Jesus. Now, how many of you know Jesus was perfect? He was the sinless, spotless lamb of God. And so is God the Father going to condemn Jesus? No, there's no reason to condemn. He can't condemn Jesus because he was perfect. And so guess what? If we are in Jesus, then we cannot be condemned either. Amen. We cannot be condemned. You need to grab a hold of that. Because sometimes we feel pretty lousy, don't we? Sometimes we feel like, man, I'm just like the worst Christian at Harbor Light Church. I'd say raise your hand if you felt that. We'd probably all raise our hands. Just to be honest with you. And what you need to understand is that there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation finds you guilty and punishes you. If you're in Jesus Christ, you've already been found declared innocent by the righteousness of Christ. And he has taken his stripes and his back. He bared them, amen, when he went to Calvary. And so basically... You, in a legal sense, are never, ever, as long as you are pointing your life toward Christ, being real with God, living for him. I don't mean kicking the tire and playing games. I mean, you really are living for God. That means 
You might make a mistake. You might blow it. But legally, you are not condemned. You are not sentenced. You are not found guilty. It's impossible for you to be found guilty. But what will happen, and we need to understand this conviction part of it, it's more relational. It, it, it's not about whether you're found guilty and going to be punished. It's about you have a best friend and his name is Jesus. And he says, I'm going to live inside of you. I'm, my Holy Spirit, I'm going to send to you. And when you do something wrong, what happens is you can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will say, I, I don't like you doing that. And what you are experiencing is, is conviction uh, and understanding that God is kind of saying, mm, I don't think that was a good idea. I don't think that's something you should keep doing. And, 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 and he's letting you know relationally, but you are not condemned. I, I could say it like this. I don't know if this applies, but my wife and I, we've been married 30-something years. Best woman in the whole world. Amen. I love her with all my heart. But sometimes she's mean to me. She just flat out mean. I had a great idea for, to do something at the church two days ago. Yeah, we're, we're, let's do this. We're going to put this. She's, no, no. They're like a big old diesel. Honk, honk. You know? And, but just because... We may have a disagreement and she's not all lovey-dovey and neither am I for a moment. Guess what? We're still married. Doesn't mean we're legally not married. It means the relationship is just a little rough right there. And that's how it is with the Lord. When you make a mistake and you sin, God doesn't condemn you. God doesn't say, I'm not your savior. God doesn't cast you aside or throw stones at you. He says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Come unto me and I'll forgive you and I'll bless you. You, need to you are not found guilty. There's no condemnation. If you're in Jesus Christ, somebody ought to get happier than this. Come on, this is good stuff. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and I thought about this. At this point, she wasn't even a Christian. She was just some sinner woman who got caught in the very act. And if he didn't cast stones at her, how about us who are already have accepted Christ and we're in Christ? I mean, you, you, you need to get this down. Otherwise, you won't be free. And so I'm free because I know, man, even if I go out there and do something bad today, God forbid I do that. I hope I don't. But if I get some idiot in front of me driving like, amen, he's in the Costco parking lot, I just might. I won't say it out loud, but that word that starts with an M just always pops in my mind. And, and, and the reality is, is that he's never, ever going to condemn us. And so don't throw stones. Amen. Number three, and this is the last, and I'm closing. Jesus says next to her what? Go and sin no more. You know what he's really saying here? You know what this means to me? What he's really saying here is that Lady, you've just had a miracle transpire. He just got saved, amen. You just received no condemnation. You were found innocent even though you were guilty. And, and, and lady, you deserve death, but, but look what happened here. Now you have life instead. In other words, what he's saying is don't blow the opportunity that I gave you. Don't mess around with the opportunity that I gave Go. And don't live the same old way as you lived before. Go and sin. That doesn't mean go and be perfect. It means to turn from that old lifestyle. Turn from that old, go and don't do this kind of stuff you're doing no more. Amen. I guarantee you, this woman here, she probably still had a mouth on her. She still had some stuff needed cleaning up. But, but she's going to blow it. But guess what? She blows it as long as she's heading her life toward Christ and trying no condemnation. What he's saying is, lady, I've given you a great opportunity. Amen. And I want you to go and make the most out of it. And friends, 
God has given you a great opportunity. You have your right mind. You have breath in your body. We sang it today, the breath in your lungs belong to God. He woke you up this morning. He spared you from death and destruction. He's kept you all these years. All these years, he's kept you. Don't blow the opportunity. I'm living free. And with that freedom comes an opportunity for me to make my own decisions, good or bad. What he's saying is, look, lady, go and, go and start making better decisions. Start making good decisions in your life. That's what he's really saying. And I want to tell you today, we are so blessed. We have so much grace that's been given to us. Some of us, our own families have written us off. Some of us, we have done so much stuff. What this lady did would be peanuts compared to what some of us have done. And yet God says, I freely forgive you. Make the most of that opportunity. Your life is before you. It says, the fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Reverence God. Reverence Him. It's the key that unlocks the door to riches, honor, and life. You want to live a good life? Honor God. Reverence Him. Treat Him with devoted differential treatment. Treat Him better than your husband, better than your wife. Treat Him better than anybody else. That's what it means to reverence him, to treat him with devoted, differential treatment. He's in a category his own. Treat him like that. Take advantage of the... You know, there's people all across this city right now that didn't want to get up and come to church today. They didn't even have a desire to pray today or to worship today like you all did. You all had that desire. You know what? You have so... You, you're so rich. You're so rich. You have God that has begun a good work in your life. And God says, he which has begun it will complete it. God's never, ever going to let it go by the wayside. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I think I'm starting to run the airplane around the parking lot. I better close. <laughs> this poor woman needed saving. I think the first part of my message, it was hard to get the point I was making. Here's the point. Jesus is willing and ready to help. No matter who you are, no matter what's going on in your life, he is willing to help. Always ready, always available. He's always ready to help. As a matter of fact, the worst day of her life turned into the best day of her life because Jesus was willing to help. The second little thought is don't hide our sin. If we hide our sin, we won't prosper. But if we'll confess it to the Lord, it says that we will find his mercy. Amen. Some of us have been throwing stones. Not that you're, not that you're really throwing stones literally or in a bad way, but sometimes we, we get set in our ways and our thinking that it's hard to, to see other people who have different viewpoints and different opinions, you know, uh, and kind of look down on them because they think that way or whatever. You know what, we need to not throw stones. We need to love everybody and lift up the name of Jesus wherever we go. Do not throw stones. Amen. Amen. No condemnation. Live free and go and sin no more. God didn't give you this opportunity to go back to the lifestyle you had before Christ. Go and sin no more. You have no, you have no idea what God has planned for those who love him. You have no idea what God will do in your life. I've seen so many people plucked out of the fire. And yet they put God first in their life and their whole life has changed. And now they're in, it's a whole new story, it's a whole new life. Amen. I've said enough today. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close in prayer. Stand with me all across this building today. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your people. Lord, I pray that your word would be filled with life and with power. That it would minister to each and every person, Lord. God, today, this was an amazing story of your mercy and your love and your grace. How that you saved this woman. God, right in the midst of, of her sin, right in the midst of her darkness, you 
You saved her, Lord. And I'm just wondering today if you're here, maybe your relationship with the Lord is not where it needs to be. You've not been serving God or you once did and maybe you've slipped away. And I just want to ask you today, will you receive the love that Christ offers? Because without Christ, our lives do face one day the judgment of God. And one day we're going to stand before God and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? And you might be able to, well, I was a good guy. I quit doing this. I quit doing that. I helped the neighbor with her groceries. And all that's going to say, that's not good enough. The only answer you'll be able to give is that at Harbor Light Church on February, what's the date? 27th. I said yes, and I asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life. That's the only answer that's going to get you into heaven. So I'm going to, would you bow your heads now? I'm going to pray. And I'm, Father, right now, you know every heart, every need. And there's several today, Lord, I know that are going to make a dedication to you and receive your free gift of eternal life. And with all heads bowed, no one looking around, if you're here and you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to I need to recommit or commit my life to Christ. Would you lift your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate your sincerity this morning. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to just say a prayer of giving our lives to the Lord and making that dedication. And after that, the team's going to play some music. And I'm going to just ask you to stay in the presence of the Lord. You can sit, stand. These altars are open. You can come down to this altar and pray. But say this prayer with me if you raised your hand and you want to. Or even if you didn't raise your hand, say this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. And please, Lord, change my life and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.